Hello, I'm Greg Gutfeld with Lisa <laughs> Booth, Juan Williams, Jesse Waters, and she once was stranded on a cheese it. Dana Perino, the five. Well, stock up on the noisemakers, silly hats, and Xanax. The 2020 election is only 838 days away. A new poll shows that three out of four Democrats believe it's time for a fresh face. Can you blame them? Check out their ghosts of candidates past. Biden, Hillary, Bernie, a cross between the Three Stooges and Cocoon. The only way to get out that vote is to deliver walkers door to door while yelling fire. Biden, he thinks Amtrak is a success. <laughs> it loses a billion a year. Hillary, everyone loves a rematch, but everyone also loves a winner. The only thing she's won is ridicule. It's less a rematch and more a remake of Bride of Chucky. And Bernie, a relic pushing another relic called socialism. He's likable, but his beliefs are toxic. He's like those delicious berries you pick that poison your whole tribe. And we can't forget Liz, can we? But as someone who is 2% Native American, I have reservations. <laughs> I do. I could say that. I'm Native American. Part of me. Not sure what part, though. <laughs> so Dems want somebody new, somebody different. Where could they have learned this? Anthony Weiner. Did you know that? She's married to Anthony Weiner. You know, the little bing, bing, bing. Bum, bum. I love you very much. Uh, yeah, from the guy they hate so much. That's the hypocrisy. The people who despise Trump are now looking for their own Trump, meaning a punk rock outsider who rejects the establishment and wins. Why? Perhaps we figured out that the worst thing about politics are politicians. And if we learned anything from 2016, it's that nothing will ever be the same. Right. You can't go home again. And if you're a Democrat, that includes retirement homes. So, yep. They need a new face, especially one that knows the issues. My choice? We need to occupy every airport. We need to occupy every border. We need to occupy every ICE office until those kids are back with their parents. Capitalism has not always existed in the world, and it will not always exist in the world. We use the term the occupation of Palestine. Mm. What did oh. you mean by that? Oh, um... I think it, what I meant is like the, the settlements. I am not the expert on geopolitics on this issue. Trust me, Democrats, pick her. You will win in a landslide. They might. <laughs> Dana, you agree with me? Well, I think that when the Democrats, every election is about new, but this is why we had hope and change. Yes. Right. And the Democrats did go with something new in 2008. They rejected Hillary Clinton and they nominated Barack Obama to be their candidate. And he was able to win. Um, and then the Republicans go the other way. They're like, OK, well, we're going to go with Trump. So now the Democrats are going to have probably 15 to 17 people on stage fighting right. it out over the next. I mean, it's not far away. The mid the midterm election is November. 6th, the 2020 general election starts November 7th. Mm. Right. So it, you really are going to start seeing a lot more of this. And I, I don't think that necessarily she would win this time around, but the left is becoming more progressive. They want somebody new and different, somebody who's willing to fight, even if it's futile, right? For example, in the uh, Supreme Court nomination of Dan Pfeiffer, who was the former communications director for Obama, he's out on his uh, book tour now, and he says, even though we know we're probably going to lose, it's worth fighting. Yeah. Fighting to the death. Like, well, you might just fight to the death. Yeah, it's like when you're arguing with the spouse. Right, just stop. <laughs> yeah, Juan, welcome back. You did a great job at the All-Star Game. Um, I think I have to defend uh, Alexandria. Most people don't know how to explain the Middle East. No. <laughs> yes. And especially if you're 28. And yes. she's, I mean, she's yeah. a newcomer to the political yeah. stage. And forget the geopolitical stage. She's never been on it. Yeah. I don't think she's gotten there yet. Mm. Uh, but I think you're exactly right that people want a new face. And it's not only that they want a new face. It's interesting. I saw in the polls that there's a split between people who voted for Hillary as to whether or not they would even take a Hillary back. Now, I think where the argument you'd get, Greg, is from the Bernie supporters. Right. Who see him as... Cortez, same thing. More energy. And here's one thing I noticed in the, in, the, in the research. 
Democratic strategists saying we want somebody who will punch Trump in the face, mm -hmm. right? So they want someone who plays like Trump, who's bullying, has the kind of De Niro. We could be an era, <laughs> right? Yeah, that could be. But I, I think an actor, a celebrity, yeah. right? Somebody who brings name ID to the table, has pockets of their own money, mm -hmm. and challenges the party's base. That's mm, sounds like your guy's candidate. Yes, yeah. there you go. Yeah. All right, Jesse, I, I like the idea of a rematch. The reason why, I don't think Hillary wants to be forever known as the person who lost to Trump, that's going to be the first line in the obituary. Not that she was Secretary of State, but, what but that she lost to Trump. Twice? What? But if she lost again, <laughs> that she lost twice. That would be a great <laughs> <time>. <laughs> It's worse than the first time. Uh, that's right. I don't think that's a good idea. I have listened to a lot of kind of mediocre and preposterous monologues, but I think that <laughs> might have been one of your best monologues in a long time. That was very good. Almost as if I wrote it myself. Just kidding. Um, no, I think the Democrats need to nominate a fresh face, and I'm going to be contributing mm -hmm. to the campaign coffers yes. of this little socialist Cortez, whatever her name is. But the Democrats <laughs> are right. When they pull this, they want a fresh face. They win with fresh faces. They win with Bill Clinton. They will with Barack Obama. And they lose with Gore and Kerry and Hillary. So like you said, they want someone that's going to punch Trump square in the face. And they don't want to do this Michelle Obama thing where, you know, Trump goes low, we go high. They're ready to get in the mud, but there's problems yeah. with that. The only person I can see really going toe-to-toe -to -toe with him verbally is Biden. And I would not call Biden a fresh face. Also, when you get in the mud with Donald Trump, you never really get out. He's a brawler and he wins ugly. We're going to get to Rubio. <laughs> exactly. That was ugly. Yeah. And also, it doesn't set up a contrast, a mini Trump. And I, I think you win when you set up a nice contrast, but it, they, they're having a civil war. Mm -hmm. And the energy and the idealism is on the far left, and the money and the practicality yeah. is more towards the center. And we're going to watch this thing, and it's going to be great to watch, but the media is going to cover up all this internal friction, and that's going to be to the detriment of the Democratic Party. It's well, better to have all these fights out in the open. Well, it's interesting, too, because to Dana's point, Democrats used to be really good at sort of stifling primaries and clearing them out, and now they're not as much because you have this progressive wing of the party that is supercharged up. We've seen that come in fruition. This primary series, uh, uh, primary time where we, we hadn't really seen that before, but I think the bigger problem for Democrats is President Obama had really focused on identity politics for eight years, and with that, you saw a narrowing, a narrowing of the Democratic Party, and Republicans were able to take advantage of that during the midterm elections, and President Trump was as well, of being able to pick up these Democrat strongholds that hadn't gone for Republicans in quite some time. So I think this push to the left, focusing on things like abolishing ICE, only further narrows the party, which hurts them and is a negative impact heading into 2020. Well, you know, that's the point. It actually, Juan, it's like, and I mean, we talked about this, about how Trump wasn't an ideologue. He was some, I mean, he, uh, these, some of these stances he had were liberal. Some of them were definitely not Republican. What if, should the Dems be focusing on somebody who is not an ideological Democrat? I don't know. I don't know how we would define an ideological Democrat on the left. I mean, I'm not sure. A because communist. A communist. <laughs> I think that's the way a you guys are uh, socialist. Don't ask Democrat a Republican to help you. <laughs> a Republican will not help you. I was foolish. I was a foolish man to ask that question. You know what I think, though, is interesting. It, it, I think the counter to Trump may be a woman. Who do you want to see? And a young woman, not unlike that Rosie one. O'Donnell. <laughs> no, no, no. Like I think a young, energetic woman who is unapologetic in saying, you know what? Yep, I think but we should you. have health care in this country. Yep, I think that we should raise the minimum wage. Yeah, I think that we should have no more student debt for people who are trying to get an education. Who is this lady, That's though? pretty strong. Well, she's one of them, but I think she's too inexperienced. As yeah, you how old is she? Answer. Don't you have to be 35? Yeah. 28, right? Yeah, yeah, you got it. To run for president, yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That eliminates me, too. Mm. You know, um, <laughs> the other, this, this contrast thing, large number of Democrat, uh, uh, Republican candidates that looked alike made Trump stand out. We've talked about yes. that. So I think you're going to end up with a Democrat that stands out. Right, because a lot of the, of the 15 uh, possible Democrats, a lot of them are senators. Right. Okay, and it's hard to run from the Senate. Um, especially, well, Obama did it, um, but I think McCain and Hillary Clinton showed that it's, it's just Carrie. really hard. Yeah, um, oh, yeah Kerry as well. Um, so 
Yeah, I have a surprise that his name hasn't surfaced a little oh. bit more. He has a book coming out September 24th, Ooh. so you might want to add Man John Kerry. The seed. To, you you, you planted the seed with Al Franken, <laughs> <laughs> and look what happened with that. <laughs> Who else do you want me to add? Yes, um, the other Crossing thing off the is, list. Though, that what's interesting is um, President Trump will have a record to run on. Um, and he will be a known entity to Republicans. He's got right now a 90% approval rating amongst Republicans. So he's running solo, and he has a record to run on in a good economy. Then you have this massive primary where really only 20% of the country is saying, okay, we are really far left. 20% are saying they're really far right. Now you see in, in surveys, 60% of Americans are saying, I'm independent. Mm -hmm. So what happens if in the primary you go so far left? To me, that gives President Trump a pretty good opening yeah to walk right back in. And also, and here's, like, here's where I just think the Democrats faced their hardest challenge. When the Tea Party was ignited, it was based off of policy. It was based off of Obama. bailouts and Obamacare and yeah. spending. And they had these great rallies where they cleaned up after themselves. Yes, they and did. they had speakers. And then they translated that into winning back the House. And they did all right in the Senate. They kind of cut their nose off despite their face a few times. But it, it translated into electoral success. The Democrats' energy, I wouldn't call it at the level of a Tea Party. I I mean, right now they have small rallies. There's no great speaker. And their basic message is, I hate Trump. It's not really around a policy. And the policy that it is around is either abolish ICE or we want socialism. Well, and their tactics have backfired, chasing people out of restaurants, yelling horrible things at people. I just don't know if they're ready for prime time in terms of fielding good candidates to take back the house. Well, and it's also when you have a crowded primary field, you can see a lot of these people that are being discussed, like a Kamala Harris, a Cory Booker, they all kind of occupy the same space. You could inevitably see someone come down the middle like Trump did, President Trump did, that nobody saw coming. So, Peter I Strzok. Mean, yeah. <laughs> but I think, I think the one thing that's not in Hopefully the equation not. as you've drawn it is the, the tremendous energy on the left because of Trump. And I think that now extends to the middle. And you see that in the polls, Jesse. The intensity on the left going into the midterms far exceeds what you're seeing on yep. the right, even with something like Kavanaugh. And certainly when it comes to taxes, I don't know what the Republican message is other than we don't like immigrants. Jobs, economy, oh, wow, that's a winning. Oh, you know, the uh, truth can be cheap. It gets, it get, and I said it's 838 <laughs> days away. It's actually about, I mean, 20, where are we now? 20, 2019 is where it's going to start. It's kind of scary oh, that it's yeah. so soon. No, no, it starts no, it's, 2018. You know what? It starts right now. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. Democrats and the media double down on their extreme reaction to President Trump's summit meeting with uh, Vladimir Putin. Are they playing directly into Russia's hands? <laughs> This program is brought to you by Ford. The thing about a classic, always know when you had it, everybody wants, everybody wants. Anti-Trump critics are unveiling a new conspiratorial line of attack against the president. But is this playing into Russia's hands? You decide. Trump's eagerness to sell out America proves the Russians must have something personally, politically, or financially on President Trump. And millions of Americans are left wondering if Putin indeed has something over the president. The way he behaves, uh, there is a clear signal that the Russians have something on him. My question is, what does Putin have on Trump? Hmm. Meanwhile, President Trump is defending his record on Russia while facing new questions about election meddling from the media. Is Russia still targeting the U.S., Mr. President? Thank Press, you very let's much. Go. And we're doing very well, uh, probably as well as anybody has ever done with Russia. And there's been no president ever as tough as I have been on Russia. All you have to do is look at the numbers, look at what we've done, look at sanctions, look at ambassadors uh, not there, look, unfortunately, at what happened in Syria recently. Uh, and I think President Putin knows that better than anybody, certainly a lot better than the media. He understands it, and he's not happy about it. So the White House is saying President Trump responded no to answering reporters' questions, not in regards to Russian attempts to interfere in the midterm elections. All right, Juan, you haven't been here for the last two days, thank goodness. <laughs> but um, I know you've been chopping at the bit here to talk about all this Helsinki chaos. Why don't you go ahead? 
Well, no, I think the first thing we should talk about, Jesse, is this idea that he's compromised, that they have something on him, because this is all over now. I mean, when you hear Leon Panetta, right. and I think uh, Leon Panetta is widely respected across the political divide in our polarized country, say, hey, you know, his behavior is mighty peculiar, and it's not explained except by the idea that somehow somebody has some leverage over him, whether it's the notorious tape or money or finances. So today I noticed a lot of pick up on the idea that Congress could say, hey, let us see your tax returns, Mr. President. Let's just get this out of the way so we know that you're not somehow financially, uh, you know, in debt to the to the Russians. Juan says, Dana, that it has to be something that the Russians have on Trump to explain his behavior. Couldn't you also say, you know, Trump's not living in a Cold War world anymore and he honestly thinks he's his outreach to the Russians is just going to make the world a better and safer place. You can say a lot of things. I do wonder if the Democrats have somehow some poll tested information because um, you can see when like the bat signal goes out yeah, and they all script. use the same language. Yeah. I mean, Republicans do that too, but in this case, but they're better I mean, at they, it. They were really focused just last week when Brett Kavanaugh was nominated to the Supreme Court a week ago today. What did they say? Um, it was all about health care. Oh. Remember, we talked about, oh, the Democrats are zeroing in on a message. They're going to run on health care going into the midterms. And it changes all of a sudden. And I wonder if some sort of overnight polling had come in and said, you know what really energizes the base? It's not health care. You're right. It's Russia. So they we're just going to focus on this uh, writ large. I do think that the question being, um, isn't this what Russia wants, meaning the, the all the chaos within here? I think, you know, what Russia really wants is, well, Putin wants to reconstitute the USSR. He wants power, prestige. He wants to be seen as a big global leader. He was doing poorly in his country because of the economic conditions. When he uh, invaded Crimea, his poll numbers went way up. Well, that's started to go down because one of the things they have a huge problem with is their economy. Putin has suggested raising the retirement age. He went from a 68% approval rating in March to down to 49% now. And that doesn't have to do with President Putin. Those, that's domestic politics. And every leader takes their own domestic politics to the world stage. And President Trump did too. What do you think about that? Do you think this... Uh you know, traitor talk and they have something on him talk is playing into Russia's hands. I do love the traitor talk because uh, only on CNN is Trump a hardcore nationalist who would then betray his country. <laughs> I mean, there's so many contradictions in this that he's a, he's an appeaser to Putin, yet he's trying to take the pipeline away from him. It's amazing to me. Um, I have an alternative explanation. I look at Trump's behavior as somebody who didn't see what he did wrong. And it is so obvious his reaction to the reaction was like, what did I do? This is just what I do. I've been talking about this for two years, about to working with people, working with Russia. It might make a better world if you know for prosperity and peace if you work with these people. What a, and, and in his head, it is a business transaction. What he's doing is what he's. You got to. I got to build this casino in Atlantic City. I got to go talk to Sammy the Bull so I can make sure everything goes well. He sees Putin as just a little player that you grease. So you can get the things that you need. The problem is this little player, Putin, happens to be involved in a lot of things. Yeah, Whether it's the, yeah, the interference. Right? Yeah, interference. Yeah. Interference, Middle East, Iran, North Korea. He can help yes. in all of those things. So what he's doing is, okay, I'm going to give Putin a little bit of stature, a little bit of status. In return, he might be able to help us with all of those things. That's a transaction. And that's why he doesn't see it as anything wrong. And frankly, neither do I. So, so yeah, he's a businessman and he's not steeped in this kind of Cold War mentality where everybody in Washington understands we've been fighting the Russians for decade after decade and we can't ever be nice to them. And Trump comes in with the slap on the back and the handshake and just blows the whole system up. Well, the irony is that President Trump's policies have been tougher than President Obama. So it's sort of ironic that we're at this point and we're having these discussions. But I think a lot of people want to look at Russia for sowing the division in the country, but we're the ones doing that as a country. And we've seen so much uh, divisions and so much divisiveness over the last few years. And we as Americans are responsible for that. So I think we should probably look at ourselves well, and want to change that. I, and I, also, can I just say one thing about the Democrats though? I mean, 
they do feel slighted by Russia for the interference in the election, and they see that the president isn't standing up for election integrity writ Thank large. You. That is part yep. of the division. That's not that, like, they don't have a responsibility to say, okay, right, right, okay, no problem. Okay, but, 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 alternate, but well, get on, over wait, it. They didn't cause Hillary to lose. Hillary yes, lost. They did. No. 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 Well, well, here's the thing. Wait, hold he on. Let me, let me, let me, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to give terrible. you a shot. Go ahead. Okay, I, I'd like to finish my point, but uh, alternatively, you also look at something like Democrats pushing for faithless electors. I think that does a lot more to hurt the electoral process and for people to lose faith in elections. Because what is the point in voting if we're going to have faithless electors? And Democrats were pushing for that. And quite frankly, that does a lot more to hurt the process than $2,000 well, spent on social media. Well, well, ads. Well, let, me ask ask one, let me ask you a question. Okay. Do you really think yeah. some embarrassing emails about Hillary and, and Bubba and Chelsea's wedding swung the election away from Hillary Clinton? I think that you Comey, really do think the that the last 10 days, the, Comey, the WikiLeaks the second stuff, day, the Comey stuff with the Wiener uh, emails, I think. Well, Hillary is responsible for that. She's the one that's no, up the she server. did not. Comey's the one who no. decided to be. But let me just say, if she had the news the of today is to me was and I because I love my colleagues on the five when Trump says that people of higher end intellect understand what he's up to. So that's why I came back to the show, because I figured I'd be surrounded we by people. I but I must that. say, how can you guys not, fo you're focusing on, oh, the Democrat, this, this guy is saying, oh, no, Russians aren't interfering, contradicting our own intelligence, our own Senate, I mean, it's like he's not on our team. He's working for the other team. How can you ignore this? Well, I, again. we're not ignoring it. We're talking about it. And at least he didn't bow to the Saudi king. Oh, get out of here. Our designer baby's coming to America. The controversy up next. Memories can live on, but the good old days are good and gone. Even when you feel like you still need it. Let our love rest in peace. Hanging off my shore. A major moral and scientific debate is heating up after a landmark decision in the UK where the leading ethics council there has given the go-ahead to genetically modify babies. In other words, parents could predetermine the DNA, including physical attributes of their future children. In the lab, The Guardian reporting, quote, the UK-based Nuffield Council on Bioethics says changing the DNA of a human embryo could be morally permissible if it is in the child's best interest. Critics worry the technology could be misused to create a genetic elite. Greg, this is not a new topic. It might be new that the UK is making a formal decision, but like this has been going on for quite a while. Right. And it's, as far as I can see so far, it's mostly to try to prevent illnesses and disease. Yeah, uh, critics of new technology are almost always wrong. Right. They always go, oh my God, something bad's gonna happen, and they do science no favors. If you have a chance to eliminate or reduce the certainty of certain lifelong medical disorders among children, genetic modification could prevent that problem. These are gene therapies. And by the way, when a pregnant woman goes on supplements or quits smoking or reduces alcohol, she's designing a baby too. Uh, when you read to your child, when you introduce discipline and, and, and certain kind of moral precepts, you're designing a child. If anything, we need more design than ever. <laughs> that is a, I've seen these that kids. That could be a controversial <laughs> way to look at it. <laughs> Listen, I think in 100 years, everyone that has money is going to have a designer baby to a certain extent. It's going to be little Jesse Waters. Well, yeah. <laughs> Perfection. <laughs> <laughs> embodied and you know they're gonna say they tinker with the genome a little taller a little better looking a little smarter funnier and um and that's how it's gonna be because everybody wants to play god all humans want to play god especially if you're rich you want to play god i don't know if i would do it i like to roll the dice you know but i mean if you can get a lock and you can afford a lock I don't see why people wouldn't do it. The, the problem, I, I don't know if America is ready for it, though. But the problem is they're not God. And I come from this from a personal approach in the sense that I have an aunt who's special needs and a little brother with Asperger's. And these are the types of people that folks would try to avoid having. So I look at this from a, a very personal yeah. lens and the sense that my aunt is the wisest person I've ever met. My little brother is the most warm-hearted, one of the smartest people I've ever met. And I can't imagine a life or a world without them. And quite yeah. frankly, I think we have more to learn from individuals with special needs in this country than they have from us. So I fully oppose this. And I look at it very similar to what countries like Iceland are doing yeah. with aborting babies with Down syndrome and trying to essentially eliminate kids with Down syndrome. And I, I find it disgusting. And I, I look at this from a, a purely what political or a, a purely personal standpoint. How do you feel about like cochlear implants, which allow the deaf to hear? But I think what you're looking at with this is you're 
who gets to make the kind of decisions about what sort of genes and defects, quote unquote defects, that we're making? I think and the parents. Well, like, for right. instance, like theoretically, if, if you see that the child has some sort of abnormality and you can go into a lab with a doctor and say, maybe if I can tweak a gene and then the, the child does not have that abnormality, the parents are getting an opportunity to make that decision. But is that what is, this is about? No, yes. that's, that's if, for example, in the case that we're discussing, the one that the British approved, it had to do with a heart problem, right? Yes. Right. And that was specific. Right. Now, what they say is that most of the things, like if you say, oh, I want to be more like Jesse Waters, I want to be more yeah. athletic. No more one head. wants they that. Don't, <laughs> I, Even I like Jesse. Mrs. I let Mrs. Waters That's respond. That's why Jesse supports this. Yeah. But, but they, they don't know how to quite do that yet. Yeah. And now this technology invented in the U.S., but guess who is specializing and pushing it? The Chinese. Yes. And they have, you know, the, they used to have the one child policy right. and the like. This does not bode well. So what you get is, to me, and, and, and speaking as an American, is a worry about inequities. Because it seems to me, just like, you know, the children of the rich have a higher chance of getting into Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, guess what? The children of the rich are the ones who would benefit from genetic engineering yeah. of some type. Right? So they become also, like a super race of people. But also, so. Greg, also often when there is a new technology, the ethical concerns and the legislation or the regulation always lags. And so isn't it too late to have yeah, this discussion? Yeah, I think it is. And I do think it, going back to the, the case that Juan brings up, I think it is about stuff like that. I think it's not about making Jesse Waters uh, a, a newer, a better Jesse Waters, if that's possible. <laughs> um, but the reason why I bring up the, the cochlear, cochlear implants is there is a movement of people who believe that you're eliminating deaf culture so that th that actual cochlear implants which allow you to hear is actually a bad thing and it's like well who's to judge that right if i if, if a parent wants their child to hear for the first time and their activists saying no well what no, the parents Mind should get to decide. Yeah, yeah, I think that's where you end up. But I, I don't think it's about like, you know, and, and actually it might actually, allow, it, it might reduce abortions because you're, you're uh, you know. Able to fix an abnormality. Yeah, maybe. yeah. That's interesting. Anyway, it's a, it's a very interesting discussion and it's certainly not over. Neither are we. Up next, a great political debate. Who's happier, liberals or conservatives? The answer straight ahead. I love We keep hearing the term Trump derangement syndrome. It's thrown around. But is it real? Are liberals really that unhappy with the president? Well, we don't have an answer on that one, folks. But new research does show that conservatives are overall happier, more satisfied, and find greater meaning in life than liberals. What do you make of this, Dana? I, that it's not new. This is, um, these studies are consistent over time. And I... I I don't know. You know, I grew up in a pretty conservative world in Wyoming and Colorado. Um, well, when Colorado was red. Um, so I think it just might be an outlook on life. Um, and possibly, and I don't know if this is true anymore, but um, re uh, attending religious services or having faith, I do think that that adds to an, uh, happiness. But also, conservatives are pretty happy with the country. They like the Constitution. They don't think it should be changed. Like, so liberals tend to really want to change all of those things. Like we're talking about a living Constitution. Like no conservatives are quite happy with what we have. And so I think that probably leads to it. But I'm not exactly sure. Maybe we, conservatives might have more dogs. <laughs> more yeah. dogs. More Lisa, dogs. Let, but let me pick up on what Dana was saying, because what the research shows is if you have more money, if you uh, are more likely to be married uh, and have kids, uh, then you're happier. Well, I have none of those things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm pretty, yeah, yeah, and I'm pretty happy. I, mean, I do think, I think data, you'd made really good points. And I think the religion part of it, uh, one aspect, because if you think that life is about something bigger than you, then you're going to be more outwardly focusing, right. at, focused as, a, as opposed to inward. And then two, I think Republicans are very self-reliant in the sense of we believe that we create our own success. We don't look to the government. We don't look uh, you know, for outside resources to get ahead. And so I, I think when you have that sort of mentality of if I want something, if I want to do better in life, I'm going to accomplish it on my own, that would bring a, a better sense of fulfillment and satisfaction and, and happiness. What, Greg? I yes. got I to gotta shock you. What? It says here, <laughs> 
that the happiest Americans are either extremely conservative, that's 48%, right. or extremely liberal, that's 35%. Well, that's interesting, because I was going to say that the people who aren't happy are often those who make politics personal. Um, they identify themselves so much to politics. You will never be happy. You have right. to have, you have to treat it. But, but happiness is really weird because it's, it's really about long-term satisfaction. And they do these studies and they find that people are satisfied relative to others. Meaning like if you could be happy at five foot eight, but if all of you were five ten. I would be unhappy. So it's uh, status. It's status relative, and that's why maybe conservatives might be happier. Is that religion helps mitigate the envy and the dissatisfaction that happens with status inequality? If you ha if you don't believe in God, and I won't say where I am at this because then I'll get letters. But <laughs> st status inequality is unexplained. Like if you're in a godless mm -hmm. society and you can't explain why on Instagram everybody's having a better time than you and you don't have a community and you don't have friends that you can talk to and, and, or, or, or a higher power, all you have is envy. And I think that's, that's a very destructive Didn't thing. Didn't you just do a podcast about this? I did. Thank you for plugging well, that. Well, tell me, <laughs> remind me of the guy who wrote it, The Happiness Project. Oh, uh, Jonathan Roush. Okay. I think Greg makes Good. a good point. I mean, when I go on Instagram, I get insecure because everyone's tan and looks great with their shirt off. True. So I don't go on there anymore. But here are my theories about why this is the truth. Was that boys I, or girls? Uh, both. Oh. <laughs> um, here's what I think. I think liberals see the world through the prism of victimhood and suffering. And so they see all these wrongs that need to be correct, corrected. And it's exhausting and it's incredibly draining. I also don't think they're as patriotic. So they see they live in a country that was, you know, we overran the Indians and then we, it was built by slaves and now greedy corporations are running the show and that drives them crazy. And then also, and I think studies prove this. Wait, liberals, and, and you could be content with this? I'm saying that's how they see things. Oh, okay. I, don't, I don't see the history of the United States like that. <laughs> and then also in studies will prove that conservatives are better looking and more financially successful. So that makes liberals, I think, socially feel a little awkward. Really? Why yeah, are you that, happy? That whole Hollywood crowd, you mean those liberals they're, they're that are so happy. good looking? They're no. not happy. Yeah, but can I, can I add something? Okay. Can I disagree yeah, with what I'm you said? Dead inside. <laughs> can I disagree with one of the points yeah, yeah, you said? Yeah, yeah, studies show that children do not increase satisfaction. That's a fact. Well, that's like, a it's like because they're actually a bur they're actually harder on your life, and 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 people say, oh, children will make your life better. Well, this, but, but it says well, here, 50, it says study. here, fifty-two <laughs> percent of letters. married no, religious letters. people with have, kids very happy. I have happy. a niece, and she makes me very okay. happy. Okay, but I was saying because it's your niece, not your kid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if you were your kid, you'd be miserable. Your I'll niece. report back in a few yeah. years. <laughs> I gotta tell you, grandkids are like this too. All right, well, uh, we're not But I would say that. very quickly that the one I, when I tell people what I think are the keys to happiness: one, get as much education you have; two, get married before you have kids; mm. and three. Just keep a job until you can well, develop. You sound like a, a yeah. well, you <laughs> well, I don't think that's team. very conservative. I think that's rational. Find out who Same on thing. the five, yes, among this five brotherhood and sisterhood would be brave enough to blast off into outer space. You got to stay right here to find out who it is. Liberty Mutual Accident Forgiveness. Welcome back. So have you ever dreamed of taking a trip to space? Well, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos has your ticket to the stars for an out of this world price for reported $200,000 per person. A ride aboard this his Blue Origin space rocket will give adventurous passengers the chance to experience zero gravity. Putting cost aside, who here on the five would be willing to go? So I'm Greg. I feel like you would do this. Oh, absolutely not. I have no interest. There's no way. Really? No way in hell. No. Uh, I, I have problems in elevators. And, <laughs> and, and I don't trust Bezos. He just puts you, like you, put you in a box. Like robots aren't space. Yeah. I'm more interested in inner space. What's going on at the subatomic level? Like quantum physics in, in the relationship to time and space and your consciousness. There's, there's like a lot of speculation on that. Our consciousness, how we view the world, is based on the subparticles around us. That's more interesting. That is interesting. It is like like the fact that if it weren't for these subparticles, right. we wouldn't need. This is them. not your podcast. Got to help. <laughs> this, is, this is what happens on your podcast. It's a podcast. But it's more like is, a podcast. But this is also like a real thing. Like there's a couple different groups. You've got Richard Branson. No, you got SpaceX you, I, that are trying to corner I this say, market. Obviously, I could not afford something like that. Also, I would never go because I don't really have any interest in space. That's chump change. But I will say that there, the, the the elite in this country and 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 in Europe and and increasingly so in Asia. 
they'll spend one hundred and sixty thousand dollars on a private flight to go overseas. Yeah. Like, because so two hundred thousand dollars per person. I bet there's a lot of people take them up on this. Well, and I think for Virgin uh, or for Jeff Bezos, uh, what is it? Virgin Galactic. They already have people that have signed up. Jesse, you, you're on board with this. Um, on board. Nice one. Uh, yeah, I would go. I don't think uh, people would want me to come back, though. I think they'd like me to stay up the there. One You'd be a one-shot one wonder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't get them the round trip. Just get them the one way. Maybe it'd be a discounted price. That's right. That's right. No, I'd try anything. So yeah. I got to I got to find a, a way to get eight hundred thousand dollars by next year you because can do a I, GoFundMe I can page. think of four space cadets that I that I would <laughs> love to see go into Good one know. one. But I must say, so th th I very thought, mean to say that about the view. I, <laughs> <laughs> that's a, you got it. I was thinking, oh, you mean you actually go into outer space? But actually, you don't. You just go a couple miles. I think it's like sixty miles so up. So that makes it less scary. And then you get to see the curvature of the Earth. But the scary part, Lisa, was. Then they drop you with a parachute. You don't land. What? You splash. Oh, no thanks. But Dana, wait, wait, wait. You splash no. into the ocean? Yeah, well, they got a parachute on you. I think that's what happens. But Dana, so the big problem here is you've got, there is polling on this. And like 58% of Americans are like, this is too scary. I don't want to do this. I mean, how do they change well, those numbers? Well, I think partly it's just, as Greg was saying earlier, that people look at new technologies and they're usually wrong initially. You think, well, I'll never do that. And that was true of bicycles and vehicles, like actual cars. And now we have you know driverless cars. We're starting to get a little bit more comfortable People with that idea. People were afraid of bicycles? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. They called them the two-wheeled the two yeah. murderer. I don't know. I fell, I fell off one when I first tried riding a bike. and I But you got back up no, on it. I thought did. that people were going to get hurt, that, that there was going to cause problems. Yeah, like every everything that's new takes a while to get used to. The pencil to. sharpener. People were scared to death of it. <laughs> people were using it incorrectly. Wait, the electric pencil sharpener? Oh, so, yes. Wait, so real quick, so we've got a no? No. Yes. Jesse, yes, one. I'm sending you guys. Oh, yeah, great. All right, I'll I'm borrow your tinfoil hat. <laughs> I, I think I'm too much of a chicken for this. Maybe, maybe I'll maybe watch the video. Yeah, yeah. I'll, watch the, I'll cheer other people on. All right, well, stay tuned because one more thing is coming up next, and you're not going to want to miss it. You might take... Welcome back. So have you ever dreamed of taking a trip to space? Well, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos has your ticket to the stars for an out of this world price for reported $200,000 per person. A ride aboard this his Blue Origin space rocket will give adventurous passengers the chance to experience zero gravity. Putting cost aside, who here on the five would be willing to go? So I'm Greg. I feel like you would do this. Oh, absolutely not. I have no interest. There's no way. Really? No way in hell. No. Uh, I, I have problems in elevators. And, <laughs> and, and I don't trust Bezos. He just puts you, like you, put you in a box. Like robots that. aren't space. Yeah. I'm more interested in inner space. What's going on at the subatomic level? Like quantum physics in, in the relationship to time and space and your consciousness. There's, there's like a lot of speculation on that. Our consciousness, how we view the world, is based on the subparticles around us. That's more interesting. That is interesting. It is. Like like the fact that if it weren't for these subparticles, we wouldn't even. This is not your podcast, Gunnar. <laughs> Is this what happens on your podcast? It's a podcast. It's really like a podcast. Seriously. But this is also like a real thing. Like there's a couple of different groups. You've got Richard Branson. You've no, got SpaceX. You, they're I, trying to corner this say, market. Obviously, I could not afford something like that. Also, I would never go because I don't really have any interest in space. That's chunk change. But I will say that there, the, the, the elite in this country and, and, and in Europe and, and increasingly so in Asia, They'll spend one hundred and sixty thousand dollars on a private flight to go overseas. Yeah, like, because so two hundred thousand dollars per person. I bet there's a lot of people take them up on this. Well, and I think for Virgin uh, or for Jeff Bezos, uh, what is it? Virgin Galactic. They already have people that have signed up. Jesse, you, you on board with this? Um, on board. Nice one. Uh, yeah, I would go. I don't think uh, people would want me to come back, though. I think they'd like me to stay up there. Take, You'd be a one-shot one wonder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't get them the round trip. Just get them the one way. Maybe it'd be a discounted price. That's right. That's right. Away. No, I'd try anything. So yeah. I got I to gotta find a, a way to get $800,000 by next year. You because could do a GoFundMe I, I can page. think of four space cadets that I, that I would <laughs> love to see go into Good the one, one. But I must say, so... Th th I Very thought, mean to say that about the view. I, <laughs> <laughs> that's a, you got it. I was thinking, oh, you mean you actually go into outer space. But actually, you don't. You just go a couple miles. I think it's like 60 miles so up. So that makes it less scary. And then you get to see the curvature of the Earth. But the scary part, Lisa, was... 
Then they drop you with a parachute. You don't land. What? You splash. Oh, no thanks. But Dana, wait, 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 wait. You splash no. into the ocean? Yeah, well, they got a parachute on you. I think that's what happens. But Dana, so the big problem here is you've got, there was polling on this, and like 58% of Americans are like, this is too scary. I don't want to do this. I mean, how do they change well, those numbers? Well, I think partly it's just, as Greg was saying earlier, that people look at new technologies and they're usually wrong initially. You think, well, I'll never do that. And that was true of bicycles and vehicles, like actual cars. And now we have you know driverless cars. We're starting to get a little bit more comfortable People with that idea. People were afraid idea. of bicycles? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yep. They called them the two-wheeled the two, the two yeah. wheeled murderer. I don't know. I fell, I fell off one when I first tried riding a bike, and I but you got back up no, on it. They I thought did. that people were going to get hurt. That, that there was going to cause problems. Yeah, like every everything that's new takes a while to get used. The pencil to. sharpener. People were scared to death of the. <laughs> people were using it incorrectly. Wait, the electric pencil sharpener. Oh, so, yes. Wait, so real quick, so we've got a no, no. Yes. Jesse, yes, one. I'm sending you guys. Oh, yeah, great. All right. I'm I'll borrow too, your tinfoil hat. I, I think I'm too much of a chicken for this. Maybe, maybe I'll maybe watch the future. video. Yeah, yeah. I'll, watch the, I'll cheer other people on. All right. Well, stay tuned because one more thing is coming up next, and you're not going to want to miss it. You might take.